it's the 24th of December 2022 uh, it's about midday midday 30 a couple of quick points uh, thank you to all my students my wonderful wonderful students you know who you are just finished the first module on the signs houses and the sun moon ascendant and midheaven in the signs and houses starting the second module on the planets nine weeks starting on thursday the 6th of january if you want to join in there's still plenty of places email me at steve at stevejudd.co secondly um, i am going to be doing a one-off history of astrology seminar on zoom email me for details steve at stevejudd.co will be taking place in the uk evening time of thursday the 30th of december now today's video go and get a cup put the video on pause go and get a cup of tea or coffee or something and sit down this is 15 minutes and it's a meaty one right hopefully you're back now and you're sat down and comfortable this is about evolution using astrology i'm going to summarize this video at the end of it by suggesting that we're all born psychic and that we are conditioned out of this psychic sensitivity by a convention brought about by a society-wide prescription on the weird, the different, the individual and the unconventional. And that as a result of this millennia-long pressure, we're about to emerge as a species into a dimension of life not previously experienced. So let me define some of the terms I'm going to be using. Here's a few throwaway definitions. Health comes from the Greek holos means whole holy which is why we got the word holistic religion comes from the latin religare to bind down to retie it's the root of the word <coughs> ligament i'm going to use the words src i've coined them from serena roni dougal self-reflective consciousness that which sets us apart from any other being on planet and gives us thought speech intellect knowledge free will art science religion and imagination it releases us from error it helps us predict futures and anticipate results i'll be talking about the cerebral cortex the thin membrane layer that's surrounding the brain similar to the biosphere around our planet there but not essential for metabolic life I'll certainly be talking about the corpus callosum, the bridge linking the two hemispheres of the brain. I'll also be talking about something called psi, P-S-I. Not only the 23rd letter of the Greek alphabet, but that which gives us our potential to generate and experience psychic phenomena. Astronomy, the study of the movements of planets, stars and cosmic phenomena, and astrology, the study of the effects of those movements and eschatology, the study of beliefs about the destiny of humankind and the world. So let's start with the hard stuff, PSI, psi. There's two basically commonly accepted types of psi, receptive and projective. Receptive psi covers phenomena such as clairvoyance, telepathy, and precognition whereas projective psi is suggestive of things like mind over matter healing and psychokinetic actions so what makes psi an active force in our genetic makeup it seems to come as a result of different electrical and chemical signals primarily generated and emanating from two specific glands located in the brain these are the pituitary and the pineal the pituitary is sometimes known as the master gland and it generates both serotonin and melatonin whilst at the same time interacting with and influencing the thyroid and regulating the workings of the body the pineal gland governs the autonomic systems the sleeping the breathing the autopilot when working or driving and the subliminal retaining every experience through a kind of body memory is the body clock Altogether, this generates as psi, PSI. It's our capacity to experience and or generate what is loosely termed psychic phenomena, our sensitivity to such phenomena and our openness to experience beyond that of normal life. 
PSI seems to work best in those people who embody synchronicity in their day-to-day -day lives, who, who tend to willingly go with the flow. PSI manifests easiest in geophysical areas of little or no geomagnetic energy. Geomagnetic energy is weak around rivers, streams, crystal veins. Hence the dowsing ability of sens sensitive people is enhanced in these locations. It is also strong around fault zones where incidentally a much higher proportion of USOs are reported. In general, PSI can have three ways of manifestation. It can be cultivated by development and training over many years through yoga and meditation. It can manifest suddenly, actualizing as a result of crisis or trauma. And it can be invited or invoked through the use of organic indigenous psychotropics. Psi is elusive, seemingly with a life force of its own. Unquantifiable in laboratory conditions, it doesn't work under observation, but undeniable in terms of individual experience. There are no hard and fast rules for generating energy fields within oneself that's conducive to sight, but certain types of positive attitude do influence its generation. The release of effort effect, I know this one so well. We're only after trying, trying and trying again before finally giving up and surrendering and then the damn thing works. It works better when the end result is focused on as opposed to the problem. It works better when worked in groups and it certainly manifests easier when there's humour prevalent. I think that PSI and self-reflective consciousness together gives us the ability as a species to take templates of the past, invert them and use them as blueprints for the future. PSI and self-reflective consciousness define humanity as being different to any other species that's ever existed as far as we know on this planet. So if it's the brain, brain cells, neurons, right. When you've got sort of reptiles, some fish, they have 10 to the power of nine synapses. That's 10 with five, nine zeros after it. Midbrain mammals have 10 to the power of 10 synapses. Whales, dolphins and humans have 10 to the power of 11 synapses, which of which one tenth of them is in the cerebral cortex, that one or two millimeter brown jelly that surrounds the brain. We individually have active at any one time 10 billion neurons and 100 billion synapses, yet we can only manage a, ma a maximum of seven processes at any one given time. It may be that the cerebral cortex surrounding the brain only develop with the emergence of Cro-Magnon man and his bilobal brain. It stands to reason that the bridge between the lobes, the cerebral cortex, uh, the corpus callosum, I'm sorry, developed around the time of the emergence of Cro-Magnon and Homo sapiens. In today's culture, lobal definition suggests that left brainers are more prone to lives based on knowledge, facts, and reality, whilst right brainers have lives based on more on an allowance of magic, intuition and empathy. It is an established statistic that we only use 17 to 18% of our brains whilst we're awake and 22 to 23% of our brains whilst we're asleep. And the bits we use while we're asleep are not just the same bits we use while we're awake. It may be and probably is that the unknown capacity of the brain is awaiting some type of wake-up call and use in the future. Heisenberg's uncertainty principles pr suggest that we can never be certain about the whole of an individual, only about that aspect on which we focus our attention. The individual can never be wholly known of itself. We can never sum up the totality of an experience, only what we as individuals directly know. We trust that others experience the same phenomena in the same way as ourselves, but this is not so. Everyone's individual experience is slightly different to their neighbor. Unless we can objectively, detachedly, and impersonally measure the whole experience, we can't know if it is particle matter reality 
or wave energy imagination. Everyone's experience is unique. As I'm fond of saying, one planet, seven, different billion, seven billion different worlds. Quantum theory provides a holographic bridge between these two forms of existence and brings a balance between chaos and order. An analogy can be made here. As the astrologer Bernadette Brady postulates in her new ideas concerning complexity theory, the new and unpredictable forms of energy and life that spring from existence, that spring into existence, I'm sorry, um, between chaos and order can be compared to the emergence of life in the biosphere, the fragile layer between the chaos of space and the order of Earth. Quantum theory proves that the second law of thermodynamics, that entropy is always increasing, is wrong. Pre-quantum, we had protons, electrons, neutrons, fermions, maybe, the building blocks of matter. Post-quantum, we've got bosons and gluons. Photons are postulated and nearly there. And tachyons and gravitons are theorized, the building blocks of the future. There is a relation here between the rise of consciousness and the development of PSI, in that one comes from the other's establishment and evolution. Quantum, molecular and planetary motions and patterns reflect each other. Truly, the microcosm does reflect the macrocosm and vice versa. In science, the unexpected, when recognized, has provided world-changing breakthroughs. People such as Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Tesla, Reich. The seemingly a route by which science integrates novelty. It goes like this. There are new findings. Then there's an increase in the new findings leading to a challenge to existing assumptions. Then new paradigms and theories are born. Then there's the challenge between the old and the new. And finally, there's the acceptance of the new, incorporating and assimilating the old. I suggest that the recent development of parapsychology, the emergence of contemporary shamanism within the structures of modern culture, and the acceptance of the quantum and the astrological world are leading to a rapid re-evaluation of the nature of our perceived reality. The Earth was, complete, was first the, for the first time ever, the Earth was completely photographed from space in May 1969 from Apollo 10. And since that time, the holistic revolution has gathered pace. The idea of the Earth and all of its inhabitants being a single unified planetary organism caught on since that date, over 50 years ago now. The cities represent the cell groups. The libraries and the service stations are the memories. The phone, the internet, the radios, they represent the nervous system of this organism. The post is the slower moving hormones. Radio, television, internet messages, along with space shuttles, space probes, radio signals have combined to reach out to the galaxy and it's too late to turn insula now. The Earth is no longer a single organism. It is reaching out for contact. Six billion years ago, the Earth formed in orbit around the Sun. Five billion years ago, a combination of methane, hydrogen, nitrogen and ammonia spark, triggered by sparks from lightning gave us sugars, carbolic axes, acids, amino acids, the basic building blocks of life as we know it. Was this chance? Could this have happened anywhere? We don't know. Four billion years ago, the mixture of amino acids, proteins and enzymes make molecules which lock into smaller molecules, making macromolecules. Macromolecules arrange smaller molecules in sequence, making copies, reproduction. Three and a half billion years ago, self-replicating macromolecules combine with others, creating the first cells, algae, bacteria, exuding oxygen as waste. And for the next billion years, this waste uh, as oxides becomes, through rust, it leads to minerals. Two and a half billion years ago, oxygen forms in the atmosphere, creating ozone. So no more UV, making for a more stable environmental condition. Two billion years ago, bacteria splits and goes two ways. 
One way is that it reacts with light, develops photosynthesis, becomes plants. I'm not going there. The other way is that bacteria gains energy from food, grows and becomes animal life. These cells keep growing, eventually forming nuclei. And once you've got two nuclei, you've got sex with a need for more food. So cells begin to feed on each other. About a billion to 800 million years ago, we achieved homeostasis on this planet. Oxygen in the atmosphere stabilized at 21%. If it was at 18%, no life would be possible. If it was 24%, everything would be too damp, easily flammable. At the same time, salt in the sea stabilized at 4%. Why did oxygen and salt stabilize at these levels when they did? Food crisis because of shortages plus size of cells gave way to the answer of increasing the density of cells and clumping them together into small groups, becoming the first sponges, plankton and jellyfish. 600 million years ago, we had the first worms and mollusks. 450 million years ago, the first basic plants, ferns. 400 million years ago, the first animal life. 200 million years ago, the first proto trees and vertebrate animals. 60 million years ago, we had proto dolphins and whales. 40 million years ago, we see the development of grass and the first mammals. Four to six million years ago, we see the first hominids. 3.6 million years ago, we can date back to Lucy with knuckles and thumbs. Two million years ago, Homo erectus. One million years ago, the origin of Homo sapiens. The first requisite for life as we know it was homeostasis, which happened around 800 million years ago. And the first animals and plants don't come to 200 million years. So it seems a long time to a planet to evolve in order that a dominant species can emerge. We know that we have been walking on two feet for a few million years. And over this time, development of the brain has occurred. For at least one million of our years, we've been walking with big brains. A million years. A million years ago to 100,000 years ago, there's no clear evidence of obvious human cultural development, but then time is a great eraser. A number of different ice ages came and went, suggesting that mammalian species such as proto-humanity would have migrated with the ice sheets, but there's no evidence for this. It's been proposed that around 100,000 years ago, the female of the species made the life-changing discovery that sex led to babies and that fertility went in cycles, both in individuals' lives and in nature. Numerous studies have suggested that Neanderthalis, Neanderthal man, was essentially lunar orientated, living at night and matriarchally, matriarchically inspired. It may have been around this time that the beginnings of individuality outside of the group mind started to become a reality. By contemporary times, this has progressed to Maslow's hierarchy of needs which loosely suggests that the following steps are necessary for group and individual evolution. Firstly, food, air, water. Secondly, warmth, safety, clothing. Thirdly, love and procreation. Fourthly, esteem and status. Finally, self-actualization and enlightenment. Over 100,000 years ago to 50,000, 40,000 years ago, Neanderthal man was supreme. Homo habilis, Homo sapiens was developing. There was a group consciousness, tribal culture, societal, hunter-gatherers, cave dwellers, night dwellers. Around 40,000 years ago, the development of Cro-Magnon man led to Homo sapiens. The big difference here is that Neanderthal man is unilobal, whilst Cro-Magnon man and Homo sapiens is bilobal, with the introduction of a cerebral cortex. Within the space of 20,000 years, which is a blip in history, humanity changed from four foot high with a massive brain and a big frontal lobe, one lobe, to a being five and a half foot high with a split brain. This is in 20,000 years. That's a, a moment in history. There's no conflict between Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon, but Neanderthal is smaller whilst Cro-Magnon is taller, leaner, faster. What caused 
the shift from unilobal brain to bilobal brain in such a short space of time? In two, is it the fact that we're two totally different species? Is it population pressure? Is it the amount of protein ingested over millennia? Is it ET? Is it mushrooms? Is it genetic manipulation and enhancement? Is it a meteor? It's interesting, and I'll come back to this later, but no fossilized mushroom older than 40,000 years has ever been found. Why? 30,000 years ago, Cro-Magnon and Homo sapiens was dominant. Tribal nomadic culture, winter camping, group consciousness continued as a carryover from Neanderthal. Around 10,500 to 11,000 BC, the last retreat of the ice sheets from Eurasia, planetary topography started resembling current day coastlines. The first legends and myths from the Vedas, the Bible and Oceasian myth. 5000 BC, according to the erudite, sophisticated and learned historians of contemporary culture, Around this time is the start of civilization as we know it. Adam and Eve, Mesopotamia, Orthodoxy, Convention, Society. It's also the development of this idea of gods and originally in this ancient Sumerian culture they were called the Anunnaki. It's also the development of looking to the stars for inspiration and the birth of astrology or at least the formation of astrology into something coherent. So here's where I just want to go off planet a little bit. Right, I'm going to go a little bit hypothetical here, just for a minute or so. Terence McKenna talks a lot about his communications with what he sees as the stellar logos and the mushroom logos of the gods of the stars, the gods of the mushrooms. He suggests that the best storage for mushroom spores is in the dark below zero temperatures of outer space, pointing to the fact that no fossilized fungi exists on this planet prior to 40,000 BC and correlating that fact to the expansion of consciousness and rapid elevation of Cro-Magnon Homo sapien men from Neanderthal man at 40,000 BC. He goes on to suggest that interstellar intelligence is not necessarily the way we imagine it to be and then reports the mushroom logos as saying that, yeah, Earth was a paradise until the monkeys got out of control. Um, I think it's Michael Crick, anyway, Crick and um, Pon and Peruna f gave us the idea of panspermia, deep space life, regardless of whether fungal intelligence interacted with humanity or not. The fact remains that about 40,000 years ago, humanity went through a vastly accelerated evolutionary leap in a very short space of time. A leap that has not been replicated since, although I suggest we're on the verge of the next step. McKenna goes on to suggest that the mushroom intelligence made a deal with the emerging monkey species of 40,000 years ago, saying to them, look, we'll elevate and accelerate your consciousness and evolution, and in return, you take us back to the stars. And if you need evidence of this, consider this. In the last 150 years, we've gone from steam engine, steam engine to DNA and virtual. For the last 40,000 years, we've had what we have now, a twin lobed brain with a majority of its workings occluded from us, yet joined by the corpus callosum. We, live in small we lived in small groups, nomadic, matriarchal communities based on group consciousness. We were lunar orientated. It may be that over 40,000 to 10,000 BC, civilizations rose and fell. We don't know. 12,500 BC, some type of cataclysm seemed to have occurred. The Toltec, Olmec, Mayan structures of Central and South America are set to a procession date of about 11,000 BC. The Mayan calendar has been demonstrated to be accurate, accurate in to one five hundredth of one percent in some cases. This comes from a culture that has no record of ever having developed the wheel. Local legends speak of tall white men from the west. Polynesian legends of the same era point towards talk of the same people but from the east. The Sumerians talk of tall white winged beings from the north. It's been demonstrated that structures in Cambodia and Zimbabwe were built orientated towards stellar positions 12 and a half thousand years ago, half of a processional cycle. At the same time in Egypt, the Sphinx was being set out to face the sign of Leo rising at the vernal equinox around 10,500 BC. 
The pyramids were built between 4000 to 2500 BC, yet their position alongside the Nile relates precisely to the positions of the belt of Orion and the course of the Milky Way as it was at 10,500 BC. The sides of the Great Pyramid face the cardinal points to one thousandth of one degree. It is a fact that the Earth, courted with the Great Pyramid at the apex, splits the land mass of the Earth into four equal sections. It may be coincidence that the angle of the Great Pyramid, 5151, is similar to the latitude of Avebury, 5129. Avebury is the largest stone circle in the world, in North Wiltshire in England. The geometry of Avery gives us the same formula as generated by the pyramid, 2 pi r, pi r squared, 3 pi r. In her recent book, Anne McCauley, who's now unfortunately no longer with us, um, Megalithic Pattern and Rhythms, suggests that the recent dating of both Avery and Stonehenge to about 4000 BC predates all of the megalithic structures that traditional historians assume that represent the origins of civilization. She goes on to suggest that Mediterranean civilization was seeded from Northwest Europe and the megalithic culture, not the other way around. And the implications of that suggestion are alone are enough to completely rewrite history. There does seem to have been a point in time around 10,500 BC of global catastrophe, probably a massive flood caused by the melting of the ice caps and the stabilization of current land masses. This in turn led to humanity having a more settled lifestyle. But the existence of astronomically aware intelligent civilizations before this time is a reasonable bet. It may be that in some form or another, remnants of this civilization erected structures around the globe as a message to their descendants, us. If that is the case, the message is clear. Reach for the stars. The time since the megalithic area has seen a shift from the lunar matriarchal to the solar patriarchal, culminating today in the suppression of the feminine throughout all cultures and religion, and the ongoing squabbling between patriarchal establishments as to who has the biggest. Yet throughout patriarchal history, the feminine has survived through magic, astrology, law, witchcraft, and environmentalism. The, the repression and suppression of witchcraft is really the repression of botanical and herbal knowledge. And since the times of our ancestors, number, shape and geometry have played a crucial part in everything. We live in the most observed society in the world in the UK, with four times as much CCTV as any other country. I wondered why, until I realised that there's an, energy, there's an energy in Britain of a raw power and magic that powers us as a race. British, my British ancestors built the megaliths to an accuracy of, a, of degree only just replicable in this day and age. We have more con legends of contacts in Northwest Europe with the other world than anywhere else in the world. The fair folk, elvish folk, the brownies, the leprechauns, Puck, Robin Goodfellow, the Banshees, the Summerland, Thomas Rhymer, Tam Lynn, Robert Kirk. Here in the UK, we have more than half of the world's crop circles and majority of them happen near Avebury. This suggests to me that certain areas of the country that I'm privileged to live in have a much thinner veil than elsewhere, and beyond that veil lies a different world. The thinning of one's own personal veil, the ways to do this are varied, meditation, yoga, crisis and trauma, psychotropics even. This psychedelic experience is not to be avoided or sneered at. It puts you in touch with purpose and reason. Every country in the world has a fungus or a vine of some type, but this is not recommended. I've done it, but I don't recommend it. Sudden forays into the other world can be quite traumatic and not easily prepared for. And British legends suggest that the passing of time in the other world is very different to in our dimension. One four hundred in, in that one of their days is one of our years. To the denizens of the other world, we are less than a mayfly. Seems to me that the real black magicians of this world are the nuclear and agrochemical scientists, the arms manufacturers, the industrialists and the food and drug manufacturers, as well as the churches and governments that condone this activity. It may be that any indigenous inhabitants of a different dimension to us may favour or even help those who uphold an ethical and environmental lifestyle. But of course, they could equally see us as a pest that needs eradicating, seeing as we're not doing the planet that they also live on any favours. 
There has been throughout history a succession of hints, clues and events that point to a greater truth than has been previously assumed. Many people have seized upon this notion of a greater truth and look for some type of conspiracy to deny the majority of humanity so that the few can prosper. The reality is that the key to this greater truth is and always has been permanently within us, occluded by social convention and the imposition of commercial, theological and governmental spin. The real truth is that we're all psychic. We have an open channel to whatever we conceive our link to the divine to be. We don't need figureheads to dictate how we should think, feel, emote and empathise. At the start of the 21st century, we are witnessing the collapse of a consumer and capitalist society and organised religion, as well as the end of not only organised and orthodox religion, but we're moving into a future based on empathy, compassion, human rights, clean air, water and food, or at least the desire for all of these things is getting stronger, as well as a dedication to living in a symbiotic relationship with the earth. We as a species are entering a space-time dimension different than anything before, where we will all, individually and collectively, become clearer in our purpose and our power. The key to reaching this point of illumination, this awareness of who we are and what is going on around us, is by dealing with our stuff and accepting oneself as being who we are, warts and all, and moving on. As I'm very fond of saying to my Virgo clients, you're never going to be good enough, but you're always getting better. 98% is good enough. If you had 100%, you'd have wings on your back, but don't ever stop trying. It is the effort, not the goal, that is required of us. It is the attempt, not the result, that invites the future. We've gone from cars to spaceships in 100 years, from 30 miles an hour to 9 miles a second in 60 years. When I was born, there were 2 billion people on this planet, and now there's 7, 7.5, pushing 8. By 2050, the population will be around 12 to 15 billion. When talking about primary evolution, I mentioned that when atoms, molecules and bacteria reached a large enough number, a food crisis occurred. In any situation where a host can no longer support its guest, change occurs. Whether a larger molecule supporting smaller ones, a bacteria supporting a virus or a planet supporting a species, when the supported get too many for the host, one of two things happen. Either the guest virus species mutates into larger concentrated versions of itself, multicellular organisms, or it dies. But there is an option here. An alternative version suggests a third option, that due to the emergence of self recollective consciousness and PSI, our own psychic abilities, we can make conscious choices, predict futures, and open doors to ways of being that have been previously denied to our ancestors. I suggest that the recent rate of accelerated population growth matches the rate of technological development and also matches the rate of individual consciousness enhancement and spiritual development. I further suggest that this growth, both individually and as a species, is escalating. It's not in a linear straight line, it's in an escalating graph curve, and it's reaching the point of prime vertical. Once this occurs, only one or two things can happen. Either the graph will collapse before starting again and going the other way. Perhaps this happened 12 and a half thousand years ago and caused a switch from left to right brain. Right to left brain, sorry. Or the growth pattern exceeds the limitations and parameters of the graph, suggesting that we find ourselves individually and globally in a more than three dimensional form of experience and existence. To summarize, the internet is a metaphor for the web or matrix of consciousness that's developing. And I can easily conceive of a time within my lifetime where no one will be able to enter an area with a weapon or harboring an intent without everybody automatically empathizing this and knowing as a group of the persons with intent. This coming together of consciousness is the best hope we have. Remember, we are not essential for life on this planet. We're superficial guests. Our job is done. Satellite, radio and TV waves and such like are on an unstoppable mission of contact. The Earth is seeking to become multicellular. We have the choice of going multidimensional and moving into what people like McKenna and William Gibson loosely coin hyperspace, or staying the same as we are now, killing ourselves within two to three hundred years and doing the planet a big disservice. If current scenarios are continued, the development of genetic technology will serve to strengthen our bodies against an ever more poisonous world, 
a cyborg mentality where consciousness or awareness is downloaded into a chip. This may be a future, a God in a machine, because there's certainly no rapture or God coming to save us, no intervention. This is not the scenario I want for my grandchildren. New life is evolving now, regardless of humanity. The current set of crises besetting humanity is a form of testing of our viability for further evolution. A test of consciousness, whether we are fit psychologically and spiritually to live on earth as she evolves. A change to fundamentally change, a challenge to fundamentally change our attitudes towards others and the environment. Unlike any other species that has ever existed on planet Earth, we have self-reflective consciousness. We can anticipate futures, make conscious choices, change destiny. Uniquely, responsibility for evolution has been placed on the evolutionary material, us. Our psychic potential is our greatest gift. Use it or lose it and keep your sense of humor. Mutate now. Avoid the rush.